<laughs> Welcome to another edition of Cancer Specialist Medical Minute with Dr. Rick and Dr. Danny. I'm Dr. Rick. And I'm Dr. Danny, and we're excited to be back for another episode, and we have a special guest today, Dr. Ross. So we'll introduce him in just a sec, but first, I'm going to do the favorite part of the intro of our episode, and that's the dad joke. I Rick, up, are you ready? I put up resistance, but I'm, I can't win this fight. Go ahead, All Danny. All right. What insect has high cholesterol? No idea. A um, butterfly, of course. Oh. All right. Anyway, Rick still doesn't like these so, jokes, but in ca- in, for the listeners it's out there, tradition that, now. Yeah, exactly. Tradition is strong. It's, it's torture. I think <laughs> is a better word. It's Men's Health Week, and we wanted to talk about cancers that disproportionately affect men. Some of their signs and symptoms, and maybe a way to stay one step ahead in, in getting the diagnosis. Yeah, when we say cancer in men, people think about prostate cancer or testicular cancers. But Dr. Rick, did you know that breast cancer can affect men too? In fact, I did. Did you know that esophageal cancer affects men more than women? In fact, according to the American Cancer Society, the lifetime risk of esophageal cancer in men in the United States is about 1 in 125 versus 1 in 417 in women. Look at you being the numbers guy, Dr. Rick. I thought I was the one that gave you the statistics. You are normally the numbers guy, Dr. Danny, but this week I cheated and had producer Brenna feed me some statistics. But thankfully, I don't need to be the one giving most of the opinions today. We have an expert joining us. That's right, Rick. We have Dr. Jason Ross from Borland Groover Clinic joining us today. We're so happy to have him here. He's a board certified gastroenterologist who practices here in Jacksonville. Uh, He earned his medical degree from East Tennessee State University and completed his residency at Rutgers, New Jersey Medical School in Newark. Now, Dr. Ross can probably tell you better than I can about his background and how he became a gastroenterologist at Borland Groover. So, Dr. Ross, thank you for being here, and please tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh, thanks for having me, guys. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, So, I didn't take the traditional route to uh, medicine. I was actually in dental school for... uh, a couple of years, I decided it wasn't for me. I wish I liked it. It's a great life, no call. <laughs> um, but I wanted to do something different, and uh, so went to med school and uh, just enjoy GI. You have best best of both worlds. You get to you know clinic patients. You can follow for for a lifetime, and then you get to go uh, you know play video games with uh, you know gastroscopes and colonoscopes. So uh, you know, born in Jersey, moved to. South Florida, then back to Memphis. So moved around a lot growing up, and then uh, ended up. Uh, down here, uh, and uh, parents live in South Florida and plan to, uh, they're, four da- they're four hours uh, down south and um, up here now, but uh, plan to stay for good. I really enjoy living in Jacksonville. Well, we appreciate you being here locally, uh, and obviously really appreciate you lending your expertise today. I think um, esophageal cancer with my limited fact run given to me by producer Brenna, we need to bring up in men specifically. It's certainly not a cancer that gets as much publicity as prostate cancer, as breast cancer, as some of the other things that I think we see in TV, we see in shows and things like that. But Dr. Ross, can you kind of give us and people listening sort of maybe the 10,000 foot view of esophageal cancer, what you're seeing, what are things that men in particular may need to pay attention to sure Uh, so you know two types of esophageal cancers two histologic types you know you have the uh, squamous cell and you have the adenocarcinoma Uh, adenocarcinoma is becoming much more prevalent uh, because we do a much better job at detecting it you know people who have any type of GERD symptoms any type of alarm symptoms we call them alarm symptoms if you have trouble swallowing um, if you have any you know you know blood in the stool if you're having any if you're anemic um, you know we're gonna do an upper endoscopy so uh, adenocarcinoma the big risk factors are it's heartburn that's the biggest risk factor you know having acid reflux um, you get uh, inflammation of the uh, esophagus from the uh, reflux and over time that can turn into uh, esophageal cancer um, you know I see a lot of patients who come and that's the probably one thing I see patients the most for is heartburn um, you know come in and uh, if they're over you know if they're middle-aged men even mild heartburn symptoms you know a couple times a week I'll probably just say you know let's do an end upper endoscopy it's a low-risk procedure and uh, what we want to rule out is Barrett's esophagus so Barrett's esophagus um, you have change in the mucosa you get uh, intestinal metaplasia so they look like intestinal cells and you get goblet cells and there's a spectrum I always try to put patients at ease though because the transformation of Barrett's esophagus to esophageal cancer is 
extremely, extremely low. It's about 0.1%. Um, and there's a spectrum of Barrett's. You can have Barrett's without dysplasia, meaning the cells are changing, um, low-grade dysplasia, high-grade dysplasia, and uh, all the way to cancer. So um, you kind of follow, kind of. I tell patients, you follow kind of like colon polyps. You know, after you first diagnosis, then I would probably repeat an upper endoscopy in a year. If you still have, you know, um, you know, uh, Barrett's without any dysplasia, without those change in the cells, those worrisome features, then you can start repeating it every three to five years. Um, so you do just want to, you want to, you know, be on top of it. Um, take medications like Nexium, Prilosec to help prevent the progression of, um, you know, uh, Barrett's esophagus. Um, you have all these, you know, commercials now talking about the <laughs> potential side effects of uh, proton pump inhibitors, you know, whether it's bone weakness, dementia, uh, none of those you know, especially the dementia one, not a great study. Um, someone had Barrett's esophagus. If it was my family member, I would tell them to take a low dose PPI, proton pump inhibitor like Nexium or Prilosec. Um, yeah, so that's, I mean, that's a good place to start. And then, you know, unfortunately, a lot of people uh, come in uh, to see us as gastroenterologists when symptoms, uh, you know, when they already start having symptoms more than just heartburn, difficulty swallowing, weight loss. Um, and those are alarm symptoms that, uh, you know, are worrisome. And we'll, we would do a um, EGD. Yeah, I think that's, Sort of, in my opinion, one of the toughest things is obviously heart burn is so prevalent. You know, so many people have it, and you know, obviously related to things we eat, related to anatomy, related to all these other things. What, in your opinion, should trigger someone to say maybe I need to see a specialist, a gastroenterologist with heartburn? Is it you know because we have all had heartburn at one point or another? Sort of what what do you advise you know patients? What would you say would be a good reason to come in and see you? If it's a new onset symptom, if it comes out of the blue and it's persistent, I mean, if you have a huge meal, you know, and you're you know you're out you know having fun, you know, drinking, uh, having a couple glasses of wine, and you have some indigestion, you know, and you take a tums and it goes away, you know, I would say you know let that go. But if you have repeated symptoms, you know, you wake up in the middle of the night with heartburn, um, you know, you have to elevate the head of the bed, you know, grab you know without gravity, um, you have lots of heartburn when lying down. I would say that's the time to go see your, your uh, gastroenterologist. Are there certain things that you advise patients to avoid who have, you know, gastroesophageal, uh, gastroesophageal reflux or heartburn, um, you know, foods, uh, different uh, drinks and alcoholic beverages? What do you tell patients? So, that's, so the studies have shown there's really only three good things, three lifestyle things that can really help with uh, heartburn. Not eating right before you go to bed, waiting three or four hours, you can elevate the head of the bed, and weight loss. Three great things that can uh, decrease the amount of heartburn you're having. Uh, Food-wise, I mean, if you have triggers, then I would stay away from them. I mean, if, say, you do well with tomato sauce, chocolate, eat it all you want, I mean, but uh, uh, in moderation. Uh, and uh, But if you notice that certain foods give you a problem, cause heartburn, then limit those trigger foods. I mean, there really are, there's no good studies to say, you know, let's stay away from this, stay away from that. There are those typical foods that everybody, when you ask them, okay, what gives you heartburn, you know, more than half the time people say the same things, caffeine, chocolate, you know, tomato sauce. So, but uh, otherwise you can just really eat what you want. And I guess the other end of the coin, of course, is squamous cell, carcinoma of the esophagus. Uh, there's some obviously established risk factors. Can you talk a little bit about that and sort of, you know, what people, sure. you, things yeah. things just not only for esophageal cancer, but maybe other lifestyle things that people well, should. Squamous cell, I've been doing this, what, three years now? I still have not. I've not, I've been diagnosed with squamous cell uh, cancer. Um, two most, you know, important risk factors, smoking and alcohol. Um, so those are the two biggest uh, lifestyle modifications, and they're both modifiable risk factors that you can change, you know, smoking and drinking. Um, other than that, you know, you look for maybe some different uh, um, symptoms, you know, hoarseness of the voice, you know, some, you know, changes um, like that. And, you know, ENT docs would have to get involved in, in most of those cases because those are radical surgeries, you know, removing larynx, pharynx, you know, um, you know diff much different than the adenocarcinomas. And I think um, one of the things, talking about men's, you know, awareness month, guys, is Men in general, they, I mean, it's a stereotype, but it's a stereotype for a reason, are more hesitant to go to the doctor, are more hesitant to seek care. Uh, you know, I know there's a bunch of studies looking at men live longer who have spouses because they're, the spouses tend to be the ones that actually push them to. You say that, that's funny. I'm single. So, you know, I'm, I'm, in, I'm seeing patients and they, they come in with their wives. They don't want to be there. Yes. And half the time yes. I say, you're so lucky. You need a good woman in your life to take care of you. Yeah. I don't have to account for any, you know, no one, I'm no, accountable so I'm to just, no one. I I'm eat just, what I want yes. when I want. It, it's, you know. I'm just throwing out that's a modifiable but risk that factor. Is. That's, yeah. all I'm throwing, that's all I'm throwing out there. Uh, but but in, I guess in, in reality, though, what people listening who either are men or are family members of maybe 
dads, brothers, you know, people who aren't seeking care, what would you advise them in terms of, you know, motivating factors to get into the Dr. Uh, Danny and, and Dr. Ross? I think, I mean, Dr. Ross highlighted, you know, don't wait to just the alarm symptoms. I think if it, there's a new symptom that persists and it doesn't go away, do not feel like you can't go and tell your primary care physician or if you have the ability to see a specialist first, you know, and, um, you know, I think it's it's not waiting too long until the symptoms are so severe that, you know, in the case of uh, the alarm symptoms Dr. Ross was talking about, if you are having trouble swallowing your food, that might be too late. You probably had some reflux or heartburn that preceded that, and that's when to get assessed, and, and it's catching things early, and that's true for not only esophageal cancer and uh, other types of cancer that have some warning signs. And if out there, if you are having trouble swallowing, that doesn't automatically mean you have esophageal cancer either, right, Danny? Um, sure. You know, there's a lot of other things that can cause cancer. You know, esophageal strictures from inflammation, you know, acid, you know, coming into the esophagus, that can cause inflammation of the uh, esophagus and you get strictures. Uh, you know, other things called eosinophilic esophagus. Lots of things can cause, you know, we're, trouble swallowing. We're just confused. As oncology doctors, <laughs> we, there's other non-cancer <laughs> causes of things. <laughs> yeah, so, so thank, you for yeah, thank you for enlightening You're us. <laughs> Sometimes we're slow in that regard. <laughs> well, I think flipping and talking a little bit about, because we have our gastroenterologist here next to us, you know, talking a little bit about uh, colorectal cancers and uh, screening for colorectal cancers, there's been changes yes. to the age Break, of screening. Breaking and, news. So. And yeah, so can you tell us from your perspective, um, what you advise patients and what you think of some of the new screening guidelines? Yeah, um, I think only one society still says 45 now. It's your society, right? The American Cancer Society says 45. I see patients, I say 45. If they're 45, I, you know, why not? I mean, I've, I've diagnosed, this is anecdotal, it's not, you know, research that I've done, but I've diagnosed several 30-year-olds, you know, 30, early 30s with, you know, colon cancer. So um, it seems like it's happening in younger and younger patients. Um, so I'm, I'm all for 45, you know, I think, but insurance companies aren't, you know, covering I, it either. I'm in the same boat. I mean, I anecdotally see you know, obviously a biased sample size, but young people, 30s, early 40s. And so it's, I personally took that step and, and got it done, even though I'm not near the age guidelines for it. So I, I mean, it's in my belief that it's going to be beneficial it's such a in the great long screening run. tool. And there's a stigma, you know, with the prep and, the, you know, it's, I think, uh, you know, I think, you know, gastroenterologists, especially Borland Group, are doing a great job trying to get the word. It's a great screening tool. You know, it's a day and a half that you're, you know, not comfortable eating clear liquids, you know, you know, taking a prep to give you some bowel movement so we can see throughout the colon. But it's, it, you know, you can see when you find polyps or, you know, when they're early and you don't wait till those late stages, it's a, it's a game changer and, and life is much more smooth when, when you can do that. Yeah, I think that was one of the most interesting experiences I had. I got it done with Borland Groover, so plug. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> you know, I I'd heard, heard all these horror stories about the prep and drinking, you know, gallons and gallons of liquid and all the, ter and it, it was like one thing that was like the size of a 20 ounce bottle of water and mix it together and that was it and it was not a problem at all so to your point I think it's it's things have evolved to the, where it's not nearly you know as yeah. as burdensome as it used to be. There's just no way of getting around the prep you know I tell patients to try to relax them you know I think we're going to have you know highways in the sky a society like the Jetsons <laughs> you know flying around but we're going to sleep prep in the same way yep, yep. until if you ha if you can think of a better way that you know you have a billion dollar idea right yep, there. So. Absolutely. Or do you make anything of the you know some of these other screening procedures that get advertised so yeah. there's only two first line screen i mean colonoscopy and fit test mm -hmm. i mean cologuard is not you know false positives false yeah. negatives but I've i gone, see their commercials though yeah, doesn't yeah. that mean it's, i mean it's and then right. we have our bull and goober has our slogan don't mail it in you only have one life you know there's false positives false negative and a lot of colonoscopies you do find polyps several colonoscopies you find nothing and these patients get extremely anxious you know you know because what do they know it either means you know well, to them, it means colon cancer until they have the procedure, um, and then they most of the times they don't. I shouldn't say that. I don't know the statistics, but a lot of time, you know, there's there's significant amount of false positives uh, with cologuard. So, Dr. Ross, if we have a patient who um, undergoes colonoscopy and has a uh, a tumor, you know, identified in the colon, um, and you you biopsy it, and and it unfortunately comes back as a malignancy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what are, what are the steps you take? You know, the, usually those patients are coming to us, you know, to get a, a opinion on their care and we're, we're needing to get several more steps done right. to uh, work them up and understand what stage of cancer they have in the treatment recommendations. 
Uh, so how how do you approach a patient who so, has a tumor in the rectum? I mean, so you see, you see a tumor. I mean, you, when you see a malignancy, you know it's a malignancy. Mm -hmm. You know, ninety nine percent of the time. So you know, I'll talk with them. You know, after uh, the procedure, and you know, say you know until proven otherwise, you know this it looks like colon cancer. We're going to get the ball rolling right now. We're going to you know do everything we have to do. You know, I start. We have our own imaging center, so you got uh, you know I start with imaging. Um, you know, get the referrals out to you, colorectal surgeons, and you know I give. I always give these types of patients my cell phone number too. And you know, over the year, over the past three years, for whatever it is, if I have a complication with a procedure, or I feel like you know, if you know they're not doing well after a procedure, it's never been abused either. It really hasn't. So um, I try to make it the, the process as seamless. I think that's the most important thing: walking them through it step by step, because um, it's it's being you know, it's it's a what's the term I'm looking for? You know, so being yeah, hit with a ton of bricks. Yeah, I always use the expression I use because most of the patients I see are overwhelmed or seeing 800 doctors, 800 tests, scans, procedures, it's drinking water from a fire hose. You know, you're, you're just you're just doing everything you can to capture what you can, but it's just, it's getting hit with a ton of bricks, yep. non-ending. Yep. I think there are some clear steps we take. You know, it, you know, Dr. Ross identifies that there is a tumor that appears malignant, coming back as a cancer, um, refer, referring that patient to a surgeon next. Now, you know, he, Dr. Ross talked about getting imaging because we have to stage a patient, understand is this a localized tumor, is it a tumor that's spread outside of the colon? Um, and so then you, you take steps necessary to have that tumor removed, and that's usually with a, a general surgeon or colorectal surgeon. And then medical oncology and radiation oncology is asked to, uh, you know, consult on the patient in inappropriate scenarios. I mean, there are sometimes tumors that are very superficial tumors that are sometimes in situ cancers, meaning not invading into the colon, uh, that can be removed even endoscopically and not need any other mm -hmm. treatment but that. Is, is right. that right, you, Dr. Right. You can have large polyps, you know, yeah. with uh, in situ, and if you have clean margins, um, yeah, I mean, that's it. And then you'll just watch, you know, repeat a colonoscopy soon after to make sure everything looks okay. Um, and that you go that goes for you know with the superficial um, malignancies esophageal cancers um, you know I was looking at it before I knew it was coming in here the staging of you guys got it I mean the staging of esophageal it's like I mean there's like page after page of a TMN different I mean, depending on TNM. the histology yeah. you know, grades I mean, location it's, yeah, yeah it's so um, but if they're superficial if they you know don't you know go through that muscularis propria um, you know you can we have our advanced endoscopists who can do EMRs and ESDs. So endoscopic, you know, taking the mucosa out or even going deeper and going into the submucosa to remove that tumor. And I think as I'm sure some of the listeners who are maybe patients or, you know, those not in the medical community can hear, it, you know, really you got to listen to your provider because going on Dr. Google and seeing, Googling esophageal cancer, you know, you can run the spectrum of everything depending on the stage, like Dr. Danny was saying, going through imaging. So every case is very unique in the sense that you need to know exactly what you're dealing with with that patient. So, you know, one of the things I think we all run into is, well, I read about this, or this person I know who had this had this. And so you have to realize that not every situation is the same. So it's just, it, to go back to your point is, um, it's important that we do the staging workup appropriately and then make treatment recommendations based off of that. And what's the most common staging that you guys see? I mean, how early do you catch? Esophageal can I think it's either really, really early or really, really late. You know, you can come and see, you know, with Barrett's, you have the Barrett, we talked about that, the Barrett's mucosa, and if you have any irregularities in the mucosa, any raised lesions, um, you're going to send them, you know, over for uh, resection. Um, and uh, so that's, you know, catch it early. But a lot of time, like Danny said, you know, come in with dysphagia, weight loss, um, progressive dysphagia, especially they start out with solids, then, you know, uh, you know, it goes to even liquids, they can't get liquids down, um, you know, then you're looking at advanced. But it, yeah, it's usually, you know, early or late in what I've seen. And what about with? you know, colon cancer? A lot of times, I've seen a mix. I mean, I don't know the statistics, but, you know, a lot of, some of them have metastasized, you know, invaded, you know, local in lymph nodes. Um, some of them are just local and, you know, you colon resection and, you know. I think what we've seen, I mean, I, I think anecdotally in the clinic, you, you, you take a history and you, you ask patients, okay, when, when did you first notice for colon cancer, for rectal cancers, patients oftentimes may see a little blood in their stool. 
and you ask the patient when did that start you know they might have difficulty passing stools they might have pain when they go to the bathroom potentially if it's a lower lying tumor um, you, you know so it's it, it sometimes correlates with when symptoms start but every biology is different you know tumors that start in the colon the rectum the esophagus um, everybody's different like dr rick said so the 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 pathology the histology of the tumor may be aggressive in some cases may be less aggressive in other cases and um, so, so we see a variety. I mean, I think we see a variety of stages in medical oncology. And, um, but symptom, you know, when you actually take a good history, the symptoms are kind of telling. You know, I've had patients that tell me they have had rectal bleeding for a year. And, you know, even without knowing more than that, you, you might, if there was a tumor there, suggest that it's going to be a higher stage just because the symptoms started a year ago. Um, if the symptoms started two or three months ago, you know, you might get luckier and it'd be a earlier stage, but it's not, that's not universal by any means. Well, yeah, I think the overarching theme is if you have symptoms, whether it's GERD or, you know, acid reflux for uh, esophageal cancer, or if you see obviously rectal bleeding or you're within the age group that meets for screening guidelines, that's, just, that's the message I think the take home is, you know, get screened in colon cancer's case or in, in uh, the case of Acid reflux, go see a GI, you know, gastroenterologist. So go see Dr. Ross. <laughs> see me. And, you know, for, there's no, uh, you know, screening guidelines for esophageal cancer. You're really not going to go have, a, you know, a diagnostic uh, upper endoscopy. You're going to have symptoms. But the, we try to get the word out. I think everybody, you know, oncologists, radiation oncologists, medical oncologists, us as gastroenterologists, when you're asymptomatic, that's the time to get a colonoscopy. You know, that's why we tell everybody whether you have a family history or not, whether you have a family history of polyps, uh, whether you're having symptoms or not colonoscopy and they're and at 45 now rather than 50 yeah, and it also depends on you know uh race and you know uh, how old, uh, how old you should be when you get your first colonoscopy as well i think some people are afraid of the unknown you know they don't want to go see their doctor because they're afraid of what might be found and i guess my message out there really is you know it's it's obviously a very scary time when you have these procedures and you don't know what's happening or you don't know what's going on but you have to realize that by doing these things sooner rather than later the odds of you know, if there, is, God forbid, is something they find, the odds that it's more readily treatable goes up. So I think that's, you know, very important not to just brush things off because, you know, you're, you know, you don't want to see a physician or see, seek care. Yeah. Any like, you know, advanced procedures, different things you want to talk about? With here? with esophageal cancer, you know, what what do you do for the next staging step is endoscopic ultrasound. So mm -hmm. our advanced guys, you know, that takes an additional year of training, um, you know, they're going to stage it. Your know, local regional, you know, um, can do FNAs, you know, of, of lymph nodes, and uh, that's you know. And they can see, look at the different layers of the um, esophageal mucosa and see how deep it goes, and that gives us a really good idea what the next step is going to be, and that, that, that gives you information as a uh, radiation oncologist and a medical oncologist what you're going to do next. So, yeah. Um, it's but, really a collaborative effort, you know, treating esophageal cancer in most cases. You know, you're, you're talking with gastroenterologist, surgeon, a lot of time radiation oncologist, medical oncologist, and so you need to collaborate together for these cases to give patients a chance of cure. They've also changed shattering. the, the guidelines for um, uh, surveillance. You can have more, uh, I think, you can have more uh, adenomatous polyps and wait, or the same number, and wait additional years. Okay. I think it's like seven to ten years if you have like one to two um, you oh, know, nice. adenomatous polyps rather than three to five. I'd have to look that up again because I still tell them I'm, I'm, I'm very conservative, sure. you know, and still tell them, you know, mm -hmm. one or two polyps, you know, uh, three years uh, or in three or more, you know, I mean, one or two, five years and three or more, two, uh, three years. I see. So, Danny, for Men's Health Week, uh, obviously we've hit on some gastrointestinal cancers with our illustrious guest, Dr. Ross. You know the vibes. But there's a lot of other cancers that uh, obviously predominantly affect men only, including prostate and testicular cancer. Uh, did you know, Danny, ready for a fact? That I'm ready. Are you, are you sitting down? Uh, yeah, I'm always sitting. Fair. Did you know that one in eight men will be diagnosed with prostate cancer? I did not know that, Rick. Did you look that statistic up yourself? If by looked up you mean <laughs> reading a document reading? in front of me that you provided, then I looked it up all right. I was trying to give you some credit. So these pauses are because I'm reading this for the first time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, but I think... Um, I even said it early this time. <laughs> I was so on top of it. So, you know, prostate cancer is also a cancer that we do have a screening tool for. It's very different than 
colorectal cancer or esophageal cancer in that it's not a procedure, but actually a blood test. Um, and we probably at some point will have a whole episode devoted to prostate cancer and talk more about it uh, with PSA screening. Uh, there's been changes to recommendations over the years, but I think the bottom line is if you're a man um, and you're of that age, it is important that you discuss the pros and cons of getting a PSA done uh, with your doctor. Do you have anything to add to that? I couldn't agree more. I think you have to discuss it with your physician. Um, men who have a family history of prostate cancer are at, are at higher risk. African American males are at higher risk and also at higher risk of having a more aggressive phenotype. Um, you know, I think that PSA is a good screening measure for uh, selected individuals. I think um, also seeing your primary care physician and considering um, digital rectal exams, uh, which can detect potentially an early lesion on the prostate detected by, uh, you know, feeling an abnormal growth. Um, and so these are things that are easily attainable in your primary care physician's office. And, um, you know, PSA screening has been a little controversial uh, in terms of its uh, utility in uh, diagnosing uh, prostate cancer and leading to better outcomes because we, we like to screen and lead to better outcomes in terms of curing patients and, and uh, helping patients live longer. You know, I think the, the one thing that it stands out, you know, as a medical oncologist is that if we don't screen patients with PSAs, that there are more uh, chances of patients being diagnosed at a late stage. And so, um, you know, having that conversation with your doctors is, is very important. And just real quick, some signs to look out for um, in terms of things that may indicate your prostate is either enlarged, does not necessarily mean prostate cancer, but things to be aware of and make sure you bring up uh, with your doctor. So trouble urinating, if you feel like you have to really force uh, a urination when you go to the restroom, if you see blood in your urine, if you have any unexplained weight loss or unexplained bone pain, those are important things to make sure that you make your doctor aware of. Definitely, and those are, you know, those uh, symptoms uh, that Rick's talking about are low, lower urinary tract symptoms. So it could be you're going much more frequently, waking up at night, you're having uh, difficulty urinating or even um, incompletely, you know, emptying your bladder where you have the urge to go, but you don't feel like you can get everything out. Um, and, and these are things to just discuss with your doctor, again, not to alarm any patient that these are definite signs of cancer, but, but need to be discussed further and undergo the appropriate workup. So speaking of cancers that affect men only and affect male body parts is testicular cancer. Danny, can you tell us a little bit about some of the signs or symptoms that men should be on the lookout for in terms of testicular cancer? Yes, Rick. The symptoms to look out for uh, primarily is detecting a, a lump or a growth on your testicle and the lump can be painful or it can be painless. Um, and it, it oftentimes feels um, hard, harder consistency than the normal testicle. Um, any kind of growth over a period of time, whether that's weeks or months, is concerning. Uh, but really, if you're detecting any growth on your testicle, anything that feels different than the normal testicle, you should see your primary care physician. Uh, ultimately, probably would be referred for ultrasound and, and potentially seeing a urologist. Um, there are symptoms such as groin pain, um, potentially back pain, uh, which can be symptoms of testicular cancer. But again, the primary thing to look out for is, a, is an abnormal growth, and um, uh, you should seek care if you feel that. Yeah, I think, and it also just brings up, you know, sort of like women in breast cancer, a self-examination. So mm -hmm. I think it's just important for men to understand that, you know, at least every so often, you know, in the shower, I think is what typically is recommended, you know, um, to do a self-exam of the testicular area and make sure you're not feeling any of these abnormalities that Danny was going into. Yeah. And, and testicular cancer has a extremely high cure rate. We're talking cure rates of approximately 95%. Um, uh, of course, that differs a little bit with staging, differs a little bit with what type of testicular cancer we're talking about. But you know, the fact is that a majority of males who are diagnosed with testicular cancer are cured. 
Um, there is very standard treatment for testicular cancer. It hasn't changed for over 30 years, really. Um, there are different techniques, different little uh, adjustments made with treatment, but uh, these are treatments that are available to patients in clinic setting. Um, and again, just discussing with your doctor more about any of these alarming symptoms to get evaluated soon. And, um, and that's it. Yeah, and just for frame of reference, compared to prostate cancer, you know, prostate cancer is much more common than testicular cancer. I think I said one in eight uh, was the number that uh, I did actually know, uh, mm -hmm. despite what producer Brenna thinks, was the rate for prostate cancer uh, in, in men. And then that rate in testicular cancer comparatively is one in 270. So right. it's not uncommon, but it's certainly not as common as prostate cancer. So how about uh, TiVo? Oh, yeah, Jags. the Jags. Yeah, it's a How you feeling about that? fan favorite back back in town. I think it'll put, it'll put butts in the seats for sure. Yeah. Um, I hope he, you know, hope he get, does well and gets a chance to play. And like I said, I think it's uh, the, the Jaguars finally have some lots of positive momentum behind them, which is I think they've been unfortunately lacking in their recent history. So I'm, I'm excited to see what Urban and – and uh, everyone else could do. It's going to be uh, hopefully uh, at, at, at least even if they're not winning this early on um, with Trevor Lawrence and Urban and everyone, I, I hope there's at least they're fun to watch. I think they're trying to get more excitement on offense, right? Because the last real good year was the exciting defense and they were, they were very yeah, good that, defensively. Fortunately could not recapture that magic. Um, yeah. But no, that was, a, that was a fun year. That was a year that they lost the AFC Championship to the Patriots in New England. Oh, right? that was a really wow. well-played setup. Yes. Thank you. Thanks. Wow. Interesting. So, uh, Not we to did... bring up the Patriots again. But yeah, still. but this is like every other Boston sports fan I know. They won't shut up about their teams. Yes. And literally no That's one cares. That's what we do. And My I, parents care. And I apologize, Brenna's parents, for what I'm about to say, but I'm really tired of mass holes. I mean, Whoa! they're basically <laughs> all Whoa! over the country. And they <laughs> infiltrate these nice towns that were yes. doing fine, and then they come in <laughs> with their Dunkin' Donuts and just absolutely. He says he on the Dunkin' Donuts. Yeah, we, we just finished a really big Dunkin' Donuts call. Absolutely, just rude and obnoxious, <laughs> and won't shut up about Larry Bird and Tom Brady. Well, I used to talk well, about Tom Brady. I don't want to talk about Tom Brady. I've read some I recent want to articles talk about. about Mac Jones. <laughs> yeah, that was interesting. So Tom Brady leaves the Patriots and wins a Super Bowl right away. It's almost like Belichick was he overrated? I don't know. I don't know why you're saying hot, such hot, hot takes. Things. Hot take I got for you right there, <laughs> producer Brenna. So yeah, shout out to all the massholes out there. <clears throat> well, I actually just got uh, me and my. Well, yeah, I'll put this in the episode when he gets the gift. But I just got him and I tickets to see the Pats play the Jags in Gillette. Amazing. On, uh, January 2nd, so that's his Ooh. father's day. So that's awesome. That's it's amazing. It's going to be cold. Yeah, be I was going to say, so cold. you're traveling from the warmer city to the one that'll be to under snow. stand in freezing yeah. cold weather. Okay, okay. To, but that's the type of dedication that mm -hmm. Patriots fans have. You guys just go to your stadium with your pools <laughs> in the I, sun. I can't, listen. The Patriots have been around for a lot longer than the Jaguars have, so that's an unfair. You have generational fandom, you know, Insanity. your your dad, I'm sure his parents, oh, and, yeah. and everyone else passing that down. Whereas the Jaguars, you know, we have to be the beginning of that generational pass down. So already starting on my sets and nephews got their uh, jerseys. Actually, hold on. What week is that? That's that's a late week yeah, game. Yeah, it's late. Like, Fifteen, oh, yeah. sixteen. Look at them. Don't, we don't want to talk about the Brady. All right, all right, all right. By the time, by the time he retires and they really get football, it'll, it'll have been a good purchase. But. I think it's going to be an exciting season. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. There are a lot of teams with some interesting talent on it. You know, it's there pretty. he goes again trying to talk. <laughs> and we're talking about the Browns here. Um, <laughs> The man has all the cancer facts. <laughs> so 
for those listening, go to Dr. Janie for your treatment, not for football opinions. I'm going to record this next time because <laughs> his face is just, it's just priceless. <laughs> Well, this is our segue. It's NBA playoff time. It is. It's Are just, you catching those uh, playing games? Oh my goodness, Dr. Ruth? this is like Christmas to me. My wife is. This is her least favorite time of the year. She's a football fan, but not a basketball fan. Mm. So basically, I knew I liked her. my basketball watching is she passes out and goes to sleep late at night, and then I stay up way too late watching all the games. Turn on some TNT, a little bit of. Oh yeah, no, it's. Uh, I mean. We're recording this right after almost all the playing games have been completed, and I think that Warriors-Lakers game was pretty epic. Epic game. I, I was not that I have anything invested in the Lakers or Golden State. I think I heard you might have gambled a little bit on. Yeah, LeBron fan just because Cleveland, you know, native, but uh, but not a Lakers fan. But that game. Warriors ahead all the way. LeBron for the win at the end. Just unbelievable. Yeah, with one eye. He certainly sold that eye poke. He sold it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he said he was looking at three rims, I yeah, think. Yeah, I think three rims. You know what I've always loved, and as a Heat fan, obviously I love LeBron, and I will root for LeBron. But, man, that guy really amps up when he has an injury and yeah. makes things dramatic. He does. He but does. He, but he, but we love you, LeBron. But I, but I still, my hot take is I still think he's, I do believe he's the best basketball yeah. player of all time. Well, you can tell. I mean, that, that ankle is not 100%, obviously. He's he's not moving quite as well as he did before. But um, but the end of the game, I mean, he's he's become more of a clutch player, you know, over the years. Um, you know, not, not the Kobe clutch, not the MJ clutch, but he's become more of a clutch player. It's just different. I mean, he yeah. makes the right basketball play, which right. doesn't mean every time it's the hero shot. Right. So, you know, people forget that Jordan was 1-9 in nine in his first 10 playoff series. But, yeah, that's cool. We'll, we'll just – we'll only focus on LeBron's final failures instead of all that. Now, I want to get your take on this, actually. So, what do you think of the play? And I'm going to give you just a quick uh, opinion here. So, I think it should be. So he said. He said, "Let me ask you a question." But hold on, I want to answer. I want to answer it first. Okay. I want to get your reaction to my opinion. Okay, I love so, it. <laughs> hot take. So I think that the play in they should adjust the play in and have it as eight and nine play in only. Okay. So if you're the eight or ninth seed, and I was thinking about this last night that, and you have to be within. You can make it within a game of each other within two games. And then you have a plan for the eight and the ninth seed to make it to the eighth seed. You know, I think it's a little unfair to have the seventh seed in there. Um, and I think it, it washes a little bit out when you have nine and ten in there. Um, so, you know, my proposal is eight, nine, if you're within a game or two, have that as a one, one playing game. And then that the winner is the eighth seed. So... I'm never going to turn down more basketball. So in that sense, I like the extra games but I also think you could make the argument that the playing game maybe looking at the way it worked out this year there were several games in the last game of the regular season that were de facto play-in games you know the Grizzlies played the Warriors the winner of that game was the ninth seed the loser of that game was the tenth seed so you know or excuse me the eighth or the ninth seed so if you look at it that way if you didn't have the playing tournament we would have already had those games so to me, the playing tournament is just a little extra spectacle, get extra ratings, extra games. So in that sense, I don't mind it just because it means selfishly I get more basketball. But, yeah, I think, you know, at the end of the day, that's what the league is going towards. You know, just doing things for interest and to prevent tanking, I think, is another theoretical reason why. So if the 10th seed is still in the mix, then they can't necessarily, you know, there's more teams competing for that chance to play in the playing game, which in theory – would mean more competitive basketball during the season. Yeah. There's been some blowouts this this playing, so, you know, we'll see. We'll see how not, it goes. Not all games are fun to watch, but yeah. I still do it. <laughs> Warriors-Lakers didn't disappoint. I mean, everyone's going to watch that for sure. Clearly, I need to start watching basketball. Producer Brenna, you're missing out. You're missing out. I, I mean, don't know. I think. Your basketball takes might be as good as Danny's football takes, so, you know, that's... <laughs> we, got that going. we got that going. We got that going for us. Larry? <laughs> yeah. Hey, I didn't say Larry Bird. That was Dr. Rick over there. You know. Yeah. But, well, he's the best, right? 
Yeah, Larry, no one, no one wants to hear mass holes talk about Larry Bird and Bill Belichick, well, Tom best, Brady. The best. And, uh, you know, it's just... Name some more. You can't even... <laughs> name some more. <laughs> Willie McGinnis. Who do you... Ty Law. The best. The best. Okay. So everyone's the best? Drew okay. Bledsoe? Eh. Okay. So not the best. Well, Steve Grogan? The best. Okay. Right. 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 I forgot. Uh, Massels. He's the worst. The worst. You know, people hate on... Let me get I a little rant here. A little soapbox here <clears> from so people Dr. Hate, Rick. First of all, people hate on Miami fans and as someone who originally grew up in South Florida, and most of my pro team allegiances are in South Florida. It's kind of a joke, if you ask me, that they get all this ridicule. You know, there was obviously the everyone, all oh, this talking heads. Oh, the Heat fans, they left the game early when they were down 10 with two minutes to go or a minute to go, and then they ended up winning. It's like, listen, I could show you just as many examples of Boston Garden fans leaving the game early, of Patriots fans leaving early. And so, you know, it's that part of it to me is an absolute joke. I think the Heat in their 34 years of existence have developed a fan base unlike any other in the league Whoa. over the last 30 years without the long-standing tradition of the Celtics <laughs> won a bunch of titles back in like the 50s when there was like 20 people in the, the league. 60s. Okay, in cool. The 70s. Uh, mm, some in the 70s. Shout out Bill Russell. Yeah, exactly. So it's like it's not that big an accomplishment. You had like six other teams you were playing against. Just going to throw that but, out there. But Boston fans are... It's just a, we're, I feel like we're a different breed. You know what I mean? You are. You're the ugly breed. No one wants it. No one likes it. You're the runt of the litter. No, we're not. You come out drinking Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> That's all right. That part I like. Yeah. But we're, we're, we're dedicated no matter what, except Super Bowl 51, which I'll give you that. I mean, yeah, last time I checked, there was a lot of they, people leaving. Uh, like, everybody left. So, my but point. You know who didn't stop watching? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, listen, and I'm just, I'm just saying it's very easy for people to throw rocks in a glass house. That's all I'm going to say. Fair. We, we, uh, we just started talking about football again and Danny's just glazed over. I'm just quiet now, yeah, with football, but. Well, the Browns, it's simple. They don't win and they never have and Ernest Biner fumbled the ball and it's been pretty much (laughs) downhill ever since. So I'm sorry, but that's, yeah, that's Cleveland Browns history. Again, no comment. (laughs) Thanks so much for coming back and joining us for another episode of Medical Minute. If you have any suggestions on things we should talk about, questions you'd like answered, or you just want to say hi, email us at medicalminute at csnf.us. And make sure you follow us on social media. Search Cancer Specialists of North Florida on Facebook and underscore CSNF on Twitter and Instagram and soon to be TikTok. And just for the listeners out there, Danny thought TikTok was Photoshop for videos. So I'll just leave that there. And as always, thank you for giving us a few minutes of your time. And I hope you learned something today. And remember, when it comes to your health, stay informed. Ask questions. And and tune tune in in next time. time.